Zia, thank you for those are very kind words. Um, and this dovetails nicely with the comments that Mike Steinmetz and Ed Benzel just made. Um, let's see, let me share my screen here. And I, let me just start by saying that this is really a fantastic opportunity. I wanna thank Lily Angelov and the folks at the Cleveland Clinic uh, for inviting me to this. This is definitely the most um, inclusive and diverse and I, I don't mean that in an American sense. I mean, group of surgeons I've seen in a long time that balance across six continents. Uh, my hat's off to the folks at the CCF uh, for putting this together, and Dr. Sharif as well for uh, congratulations on your presidency. So um, this is probably the best use of Zoom I've ever seen. I, we are all doing a million unnecessary Zooms, uh, but this is one capacity where uh, if you look at, and I'm not a left winger, but the carbon footprint or the expense of traveling and getting us together would be onerous and the time consumed. So, this, so congratulations. And maybe this is something that goes forward in the future. Although we'd love, as Ed said, to be fun and together as well. Uh, that is some, certainly not something of the past. So I've been asked to speak about um, an area which I have a lot of passion for, which is in the area of MIS deformity surgery. And this is uh, currently sort of a first world problem, but also I, I wish that I'd put in slides to indicate how it's applicable to the third world as well. And so this is your typical type of MIS deformity case. This is where we're at. This is a uh, T9 to the pelvis instrumentation and correction for lady. And what you can see is the other, these are the sort of the parameters on what we're looking at. So when you look at an MIS deformity surgery, it's still a big operation. It's still a big enterprise. It's still a surgery that has morbidity and cost and on very sick and old people. And I suspect that um, maybe uh, in, in, in response to the comment that Ed made that they may be able to in the second and third world leapfrog us in many ways, like how Australia leapfrogged uh, much of the Western world in terms of their social orientations, uh, maybe that MIS complex surgeries will leapfrog in, in Asia, in India, in China. And we certainly see that on many realms where China is way ahead or Korea or Japan are way ahead of us in America. So this is what's going on. And there is a building, if you will, of a set of data on the issues of MIS deformity surgery. Many of the experts are on this this faculty, I, I see Richard Asaker's on and many others, Mike Steinmetz who do this type of surgery. And if you look at the growth of this, this is sort of uh, giving you an idea of publications. I love that Ed as editor of World Neurosurgery is talking about with Mike about the issue of if you're using sort of more um, last decades technology, how do you even publish, right? I think that's a really important, maybe it's gonna be an editorial in the future, but this is, deformity surgery in MIS realm, you can see if you go back to 2008, just 10, 10, 12 years ago, just a couple of papers and now really building steam. And you're going to see papers coming out of China soon. Uh, it's really going to build ahead of steam and the technology is constantly changing. But why, why is there interest, right? And this is, this goes back to those last comments. This is uh, some of our, 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 our panelists are from close to this area. Americans relish this idea of Everest as being almost legendary in our minds and uh, and some of you live close to that area of the world and so if you think about it you know the idea of trying to, to reach the summits or challenging yourself and uh, if you if you put it in that realm MIS and deformity are exactly where they intersect right and in the US this is a paper by one of our, our least liked individuals if you will which is Richard Deo who's been the, the clarion call he's not a surgeon he's a he's like a geriatric doctor talking about how there's so much unnecessary spine surgery uh, and the, the proliferation of complex spine surgery and, I, and I, I've I've talked a lot in the past about how I think this is this is sort of a, a ruse it's 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 a it's a question of classification and how the problems are because if you look at the growth of say injections and I love the conversation about the injections earlier that Doug Orr had um, that has grown many, many times greater than spine surgery. I think the difference here is the need of the population and the desire to get through this. But spine surgeons, you know, we have a unique role. And, and this is what you do if you go to Google. It will self-populate the end of your, it'll, like your, like your wife or husband, it will complete your sentence, right? So if you type in is scoliosis surgery, it comes up with these first 10 uh, completions. Take a look at that. And, and, and let that soak in for a minute because spine surgery, and I was having this conversation yesterday with Mike Apuzo, is the only realm of surgery I'm aware of where every single patient has heard, don't ever have that surgery. There is nothing like it. Hip surgery, brain surgery, plastic surgery, urologic surgery, doesn't matter. Only us, only do we have this. And look at this, you know, I'm not perfect. No one is, I have screws and rods. I'm a spine surgery survivor, right? That's how we are viewed in the world. So 
I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, I could talk about advantages like reducing costs, preventing PJK, clinical improvement, cl coronal and sagittal correction. I'm not going to dwell too much on that because you can find that 15 minutes is not uh, enough time to talk about that. Instead, I'm going to talk about these three broad areas very much at a 40,000 foot view, which is number one, which is what Ed commented on what we shouldn't talk about is leveraging these advanced techniques. Number two is how technology is going to change how this is done. And number three is the application of MIS as a, as a realm of, of thinking, not of technique per se. So advanced techniques, right? So this is the typical talk. This is, this is as Juan Uribe would say, the butterfly collection, right? This is where you show off all your best, perfect x-rays and hide the ones that didn't look so good, right? So uh, I showed you this one already. This is a case where you can see by using posterior instrumentation, you can get good correction. Multiple ways of doing that. We published this uh, in, in multiple realms, if you will, about how to do multiple level inner body surgery uh, and, and get corrections and getting corrections in a way that can treat sort of intermediate deformity, not the very, very severe ones, but the intermediate and maybe, if you will, the more flexible uh, deformities, right? So we had to get to better or more powerful ways uh, like MISPSO, mini open pedicle subtraction osteotomies, where we can do very, very substantial corrections fixating above and below. And again, with this audience, I don't want to get too wonky about all the technical features. You can look this up in the papers that we've written using a four rod technique. Richard Osaker had a role in, in teaching me this and break the spine and, and getting control without having to open up the spine and seeing uh, the spinal column, which is what this society is about, maybe treating the column without seeing the column, right, and breaking the spine at the PSO site, and this was uh, published. So you can, you can look at these papers. I don't want to dwell too much on the pros and cons because there are pros and cons of everything that we do. With this type of technique, of course, you're doing a true three column osteotomy. You're able to correct very, very substantial deformities uh, up to the limits of the, the most severe ones, right? Uh, of course, lateral, we hear a lot of discussion about lateral and anterior surgery. Doug mentioned this about the A-lift, O-lift, X-lift, D-lift, all these approaches being used. Uh, new new routes being invented every day that are differing by a millimeter or two, and then someone's coming back and saying, I invented that 10 years ago. Uh, but the reality is this is an important realm because it's changed how we think about uh, indirect decompression of the spine. This shows the growth of interest in this area. But I think the basic principles here are the key. So here's a lady who had had a long segment fusion as a teenager, had a flat back and came in and you can see what we did was we just we just focused on the bottom of, this, of, the, of the construct doing, and she had had L4-5 fused already. So she had two surgeries, right? She had an L4-5 lateral and we just did an A-lift and with one level surgery, we're able to get her what she needs. She works in our hospital, so we see her every week. And so you can see that this is an MIS concept. You could say A-lift is MIS or not MIS. That's not really the point. It's not about tubes. It's about looking at this as a concept, and we'll come back to this, uh, and focusing on using hyperlordotic cages. We heard that nicely discussed by Mike Steinmetz. And of course, Luis Pimenta talks about the trans-psoas approach. Uh, this is the ISSG group. Nobody's not heard of the ISSG group. Uh, we have an MIS realm where we've been looking at this under the leadership of uh, Shea Bass and Chris Shaffrey. And this is just one of the papers that we've had. There are numerous papers. This shows the amount of curve correction you can get versus the preoperative curve and all these sorts of types of approaches, whether you talk about a blue surgery, which is the standalone lateral, the uh, green, which is like a lateral plus perk screws, or the red, which is where you open the back. And what you can see here is that you can add lordosis with all these techniques, uh, but here's the most important slide. This shows getting the LL to match the PI. And if you look at that, people use different techniques based on what's needed. So the important thing, as Ed was saying, is doing the right surgery on the right patient. So in the expert group, you know that some techniques are more powerful than others. You've got to apply the right technique because as the powerful, as the techniques get more powerful, they also become more morbid. Um, here, here is the MIS def uh, algorithm. Praveen Mumanini gets credit for this. This is in its second and third iterations. Now, please look it up. There's not enough time to cover it. We could do 15 minutes on that alone. Of course, the latest development is the ALL sectioning, going in and sectioning the ALL, being able to basically fish mouth this like the old uh, Smith-Peterson osteotomies. Uh, and getting tremendous correction, almost, uh, you know, like an A-lift, but higher up at areas that uh, if you've been fused down below. And the ACR has been very powerful in that realm. So you can see the ACR level here at L23, getting tremendous correction. Uh, so Juan's really published a ton about, a ton, a ton about that, he even has a new classification along with the Schwab classification to show that. So the second area I want to get to is the new or high technologies, right? And what I'm going to focus on here is making good surgeons better. 
okay? That is leveraging technology. So maybe if you will, and, and Ed says a fool, the tool is still a fool, but some people just need to have a little bit of an advantage. Like maybe I'm not as good a driver. So I need like a lane departure warning for my car, right? This is the first MIS deformity surgery that was cataloged. This was, um, we call this a Hollywood curve. This is Greg Anderson from the Rothman Institute, an orthopedic surgeon. But of course, we know navigational robotics is changing all of this. I'm not a big fan of this, but I know it is the future. This is changing everything about how we plan and think about surgery. If you think about how people come to surgery and just kind of work with the, the problem, this allows us to plan ahead and think ahead about what we're going to be doing to a patient. And that may be the biggest advantage of this type of surgery. You can think about screws being loaded ahead of time in places where maybe you can't have all the full selection of instrumentation available, right? And this is a, just a cataloging, as we talked about, in America at a national meeting, the Congress of Neurosurgeons, the number of robots that are out there right now, there's now 20 robots out there and they all do different things and they're all very special. But this is really where it comes down to how the robot's superior to us. This is a Da Vinci robot, which we don't use in spine really, putting together a sandwich. And what you can see is that you have two hands, you have 10 fingers. The robot is not confined that way. The robot hand could be a couple millimeters or it could be seven meters. That's the power of the robot. It's not that the robot's taking over the surgery. The robot is not anthropomorphized. It is not linked to the human body in our genetics. It can be built however we want to build it. And that is the true power and value of robotics. Technology is super attractive about dealing with all kinds of things in deformity, like the abnormal and atypical anatomy and tissues. And it relieves the stress on the surgeon. Think about one part. Let's just say, and people say, well, it just puts in screws for now. Let's just say the screw part is the stressful part for you. If the robot can do that for you, there's a real advantage. The last part is applying MIS principles, right? And that's in the spirit, as Rick Fessler would say, of doing minimally disruptive procedures, meaning don't poke the bear. There's a lot of cases, you know, where deformity was, was partially treated and maybe that was or wasn't enough, right? And so Tony Tenori taught me this. He says, the goal is not to make the patient 18 again. It's to make the patient the way they were before the pain really got bad. And that's a very important take-home lesson. So here's an example of a doctor's wife. This person's had scoliosis her whole life, right? She has a radiculopathy, right? And she has foraminal stenosis. Does she need a T10 to pelvis as eight other surgeons told her? Absolutely not. That is not the surgery that's needed here. We do an endoscopic de decompression. I heard that on the last chat. You guys can't all see the chat. Just doing an endoscopic focal decompression gets her the relief of the sciatic pain. Will it last forever? Of course not. She's only 66, but maybe it gets her where she needs to be for five or 10 years. And that's the idea. And here's another example trying to treat just with one level fusion, the focal area, right? So the idea is to reduce the rate of iatrogenic problems. Uh, it can be good on the frail and ill patient, reducing complications, attacking a problem piecemeal. Let the patient live to fight another day, right? So again, the results have to be measured against open surgery, which is still the gold standard. Shameless plug for our neurosurgery podcast. Ed's been a, a guest on this, one of the most subscribed to uh, episodes on our podcast. Thank you very much. Congratulations on a fantastic meeting. Okay, here's the poll. Can I ask a question of Mike? Sure, Dad, go ahead. Um, how can we, we talked about, you know, uh, high income and low income countries or first world and third world countries with widely disparate resources, et cetera. How can we leverage the technology you're talking about to help every person with spinal disorders in the world? I, I love that question Ed, because it's all about that, right? So I, I, I don't know if Rick Fesser is still on or not, but Rick published a great paper. It wasn't well controlled, but him versus, I think it was him versus Tyler Kosky. So just for the people who aren't in America, the event related acute costs of a deformity surgery like a T10 to pelvis in, at Northwestern was half a million US dollars right? And Rick was able to reduce that to like $300,000. Now I know cost numbers are, it's really not a half million dollars, but let's just say it's a hundred thousand. The, the ability to reduce the cost of the surgery oh, yeah. through but less disruption yeah. is really tremendous. And of course it's all about scaling, right? Because the first computers were the most expensive, right? So as soon as we scale, everything's going to change. And that's, that's where you know, I, I went to school at Stanford and, and the folks there are always thinking on the West Coast, thinking way ahead. We know that what we do is super expensive. BMP is price to market, but BMP does not cost that much to make. So it's really a matter of understanding this piece. And I think China, you know, with all of its power is, is doing this. Now, part of its patent violation, I, I totally get that it's politically very charged. But the reality is, is that 
we're going to get there. And I guess um, I'm probably not young enough to see it, but it's coming really fast and heavy. And I, in countries like Pakistan and India and China and Indonesia that have huge populations, they're going to crack this code. America's just leading the way with the technology. Okay. Thank you. That's my opinion. I mean, 